Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a vintage Hall of Fame review on one of my favorite Italian fragrances of all time. If you know me and you know my taste, you know that vintage 80s fragrances that are leather in nature especially, I absolutely love. And this is sort of the, um, I would say this is one of my favorite Italian perfumes ever and just kind of leave it at that. Uh, although I think this fragrance inspired many other fragrances, especially Italian fragrances that came after. And I'll talk about some of those maybe in the review. But today we are going to talk about a fragrance by the House of Trussardi. Depending on who you listen to, Parfumo says 1983, but I have heard some other sources list this at 1984. So we're going to just kind of leave it as an open-ended 83-84 release. And this is called Trussardi Uomo. Now, a couple things uh, real quick. If you take a look at the packaging, you can already see this sort of leathery. Um, it's almost like a snake skin or maybe a crocodile feeling. Um, just this um, high-end looking leather, right? It's actually plastic, but it's supposed to look high-end leather. And I actually have two versions here in my hand. I'm actually wearing today the Scannon version, which this came all the way from my brother Rich Mitch. So this was actually in Rich Mitch's house, came from Enchante in Canada, went to Rich Mitch, came back to Texas. So this this bottle is a world traveler. And um, I also have the Selective Beauty Edition, which I had before I purchased the Scannon Edition. And I can tell you guys that um, for those of you who love talking about reformulations and stuff like that, I was going to maybe try to make this a comparison video, but there's honestly no point. These two are so very, very similar that I can almost detect no differences between them. That being said, a couple asterisks that I have to say with that. Number one is that there is a first version, apparently. So there's a very first version, which is different. I, I, don't, I think it's just Trussardi Parfums or, or whatever it is. I forget who the um, original issuer was. But um, that version, some people say, is different. I've never smelled that original version of Trussardi Womo. The other thing is they reformulated this, I believe, in 2011, okay? And um, I believe Aurelien Guichard was the person who did the reformulation for the 2011 version. And that version is apparently, I've never smelled it, but it's apparently very synthetic and nothing like this. So if you are going for the vintage. I would urge you to try to get the OG. That looks like this. The newer bottle almost has this Midnight in Paris shiny silver bar around the outside, and the um, front doesn't look like snakeskin. It actually looks like um, like it's smooth, if that makes sense. And they've kind of changed the, the logo on the front. You'll be able to tell the difference instantly. If you just go for this particular looking bottle, you'll be fine, whether it's the first version that I don't have, the um, scan in version which i think came next and then the selective beauty version but these two are so close there's almost no point in comparing and contrasting so this fragrance was created by beatrice pk who also then later on in the 2000s created one of my favorite designer fragrances of all time which is l'instant de guerlain there will definitely be a hall of fame review on this fragrance one of these days and and so she is a perfumer who unfortunately left us way too soon. Uh, she passed away way too young, but while she was alive, she created two of my all-time favorites, and she actually worked with um, a couple other, I believe, Italian houses while she was around, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think she worked for houses like um, Jill Sander. Um, she worked for Chopard. She worked for Bulgari. She worked for a bunch of different brands. Salvatore Ferragamo, uh, she was kind of all over the place, okay? She did some stuff for Lamborghini. Uh, and it's interesting because some people, some people actually say that the leather in this reminds them of like a Lamborghini leather. And it's an interesting imagery. There's definitely this Italian sports car bit to the fragrance. Okay, so what is this fragrance? So this is one of the hardest things to describe. And I always struggle to do these sort of uh, what I call Vintage Hall of Fame Reviews, my all-time favorite fragrances from the past. And the reason I struggle is I really feel like no matter what I say, I'm never going to do it justice, right? Because this is such an iconic fragrance. This, this fragrance has heart and soul and mind and body to me. You know, this fragrance is like a living being. When I wear it, 
I'm like putting on a work of art. I'm putting on something that elevates me, puts me in a completely different headspace than, than many other fragrances that I wear. I love wearing these type of fragrances because they tell a story and they have soul, right? And so uh, categorizing this, I struggle. I really, really struggled because when you first spray, the top almost gives you like a little bit of an aromatic fougere because there's so many herbs and spices and it's green, and but it has this sort of uh, Italian freshness to it. If you know Italian fragrances, you know that they absolutely love this sort of fresh, um, citrusy, sometimes bitter, and there's definitely some bitter citruses in here, but this sort of bitter citrusy opening, but it's also dries down to almost what I would consider to be a leather chipra, right? If it wasn't for that aromatic fougere smelling top, I would call this a leather chipra. So how do you categorize a fragrance this um, sort of um, complex, if you will, right? So before we get into the fragrance itself, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the House of Trussardi because, shockingly to my channel, I've never reviewed a Trussardi fragrance on my channel, which is absolutely shocking. I still have Inside Man to review uh, from 2006. That's discontinued. I think that's an amazing... That's one of my favorite coffee fragrances. I was um, trying to remember some coffee fragrances that I love yesterday when I did my This Year in Perfume 2008, and I was talking about Amen Pure Coffee, which is one of the ones I love. Inside Man is another one that I absolutely love. Got a backup bottle of that, thank God, um, because that's one I never want to be without. And um, there's also a fragrance from Trussardi called Action, which I really like. It's really green and mysterious, and it's got that fougere base, you know, um, a little dihydromercenol, I think, but it definitely has that fougere fresh base, but lots of different green artemisia and stuff like that, right? Marjoram. Um, and so there's some good Trussardi reviews coming up, but I'm starting with the best. This is, if I ever ranked the House of Trussardi, hands down, there would be no question for me. This is number one, without a doubt. This is number one. I also have a bottle of Trussardi Python Womo, but I think that's my least favorite Trussardi. Actually, I know that's my least favorite Trussardi. So, um, so basically, what, what is Trussardi? For those of you that don't know, they're an Italian house that was founded in 1911 by Dante Trussardi, and it began as a high-end glove maker, like a leather glove maker, and they sold high-end leather gloves to the public and to the Italian army during World War II. After World War II, when the Italians surrendered to the Allies, and then after his death, his son Giordano took over, and it really became a family business. I believe Giordano's... Um, uh, son, whose name was Nicolai Trussardi, and Nicolai Trussardi is the one that in the 70s took Trussardi to the next level. He really wanted to sort of make them more than just a expensive leather goods maker. He wanted to make them like a lifestyle brand, a luxury, a, a, a brand that defines elegance, if you will. So if you are thinking like high-end gloves, high-end leather goods, stuff like that, Trussardi instantly would probably come to your mind if you're thinking about those kind of Italian goods from the from 100 years ago, right? But from the 70s and 80s and on, Trussardi began to symbolize much more. And unfortunately, Nicolai Trussardi, who, by the way, I should mention, designed this bottle. He designed this bottle himself. Um... And you can see the Greyhound, the Trussardi Greyhound on the top. Uh, this one's actually a tester that came from Manuge, but um, the bottle was designed by him. And if you look at other Italian fragrances, it's interesting because there are other Italian fragrances that sort of, I think, model themselves after this. I don't know if you can see, but inside, if you look right inside of there, you can see the glass bottle inside. Um, I don't know if it'll catch it in the camera. But this actually opens up. This is just basically like a, um, it goes on top of the glass bottle, if you will. So the glass bottle's inside, and um, and this goes over it. So he designed this bottle, which shout out to him. I actually really like this bottle. Some people say it, it feels cheap, but I like it. Um, I think it really represents the fragrance well. And, it, um, and, I, and I like the Greyhound right there on the front. So front and center, no nonsense bottle, right? And so Nikolai Trussardi designed it. So, um... Let's talk about the fragrance, okay? Because we talked about the fact that this is created by a titan of perfumery by Beatrice Piquet, and I really respect her work as a perfumer. Um, I don't know if this is the fragrance that really, like, got her off of the ground. She very well have made things before this, but if she did, I'm not familiar with them. So this is the earliest work from Beatrice Piquet that I know. 
And I think she created an, an absolute masterpiece. So it opens up with this aldehydic spice, okay? And the spice is toned down by the aldehydes. Yet, I think the first couple times you wear this, um, it, the spice is going to seem very in your face and very prominent, okay? Some people compare it to the spice of grandma's cupboard, right? Kitchen. Uh, and the reason I say grandma and not just your spice cupboard is because you really have to imagine spices that have been sort of... Um, sitting in the same cupboard that grandma lived in for the last 50 years, right? She lived in that house for 50 years. That was her spice cap cupboard or cabinet for 50 years. And for 50 years, those spices just got almost into the walls of the cabinet. You open it, even after grandma's died, you've taken everything out, you're getting ready to sell the house, you take all the spices out, that cupboard is just saturated with that spice smell. And this is made up of things like thyme, which thyme can give off that dry spiciness, but it can also give off a little bit of leatheriness on its own. And that is a foreshadower of things to come. So you have thyme, you have uh, marjoram, you have basil, uh, aldehydes, lavender, juniper, which gives it a little bit of that fizzy berry-like smell, um, and bergamot, okay? And the bergamot here is definitely the bitter kind. It's a bitter, uh, unsweet, dry, citrusy, aromatic sort of the aldehydes add space, okay? So the aldehydes add space between the notes. It doesn't feel as compact as some of the fragrances that came after that sort of uh, modeled themselves after this fragrance, okay? And um, the spices, like I said, uh, I feel like the aldehydes just tone them down a little bit. You don't get hit full on with them. And I think the more you wear it, the more smooth you're gonna realize that spice opening it is. And it is absolutely beautiful. Now. I mentioned a couple of fragrances that borrowed a lot from this. This is like the father of Italian masculine perfumery to me. And I know that's not true. I know that there's a lot of masculine fragrances that came before this, Capucci Porom or all these other ones that you could mention. But for me, um, this is like the father of the Italian perfumes that I really start to get interested in. A couple fragrances that borrowed a lot from the opening of Trussardi Uomo. Number one is Fendi Uomo, which... You could go back and forth between these two, and you can see Fendi Womo, uh, brilliant bottle. I love that marble with the gold, um, just an absolute masterpiece, also discontinued. And um, these two are probably the closest to each other. However, there is a third rival to Trussardi Womo, and that third rival is Moschino Porom. Now, I think Moschino Porom borrows more from Bellamy. Um, then let's say Fendi Womo does. Fendi Womo is much closer to Trussardi Womo, but the spices here are even more turned up. You don't get the aldehydes. You get some other things in here as well. Um, and I think the leather is turned up a bit, but um, here it borrows a little bit from Bellamy. And so this will get its own review. This will get its own review, but I just want to mention just how sort of... Um, how many Italian houses, Moschino, Fendi, looked at Trussardi and what Beatrice Piquet and, 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 Nicholas, and Nicolai Trussardi put together for this house. So this was my scent of the day today. I've owned this fragrance for years, okay? Um, I can't tell you exactly how many times I've worn it, but it's got to be at least half a dozen, all right? So I have vast amounts of experience with this fragrance, um, and it's such a beautiful opening because it's so Italian, you know? It gives you that sort of um, that, um, you know, that Italian, there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of gusto to the opening, right? And it's extremely masculine, completely unapologetic. And I really love that about it. It's energetic. It's alive. The opening feels very vibrant. The spices and, you know, what ends up happening is the fragrance gives you a little bit of a growl underneath, even from the very get go, right? While I'm saying that the spices are toned down the aldehydes are there, um, the woodiness is there, there's a little bit of cedar wood in here, there's some sort of warming cinnamon that comes in, you know, like grandma is mixing up a cider or something and she realizes after tasting it that, you know what, it just needs a little something to sweeten it or warm it up. There's just a tiny touch of cinnamon uh, and a little bit of honey, okay? And so it is extremely well balanced and the other thing that it is, is it's herbaceous, right? So whenever you smell it, you're going to realize that the basil and the marjoram just gives it this mild sort of green herbaceousness, herbaceousness. and especially the um, marjoram. 
I feel like it gives it this minty like feel. Okay, so just imagine there's a little bit of mint. Think of think of the um, mint combination in Derby. Vintage bottles of Derby have an amazing mint note in them, and they're mixed with an amazing sort of uh, leather note. And this came before Derby. This is done in in a different style, but um, that minty marjoram like smell, which gives it this mild um, you know, dried herb like feel woodiness as well is, is there. Um, along with that semi sweet, uh, green, but very intense basil, right? And it's extremely green. And so I said, like I said earlier, the citrus, the bergamot, um, it, um, it doesn't smell as metallic as many of the French iterations of bergamot can smell. It smells more, um, bitter. Okay. It smells bitter and it smells dry. And that's pretty much what you get through the rest of the fragrance. It does change though, okay? There's a big transition as the fragrance dries, which we'll talk about. But that opening, absolutely stunning opening. I love the opening. Um, whenever I wear this, I really feel like I'm wearing one of the best fragrances for tastes like mine. If you have vintage tastes like mine, this is one of the all-time best, in my opinion. Um, and like I said, just look at the bottle. It, it, it really captures the fragrance and what it's all about, right? <laughs> and along with that sort of um, mintiness is this dried herb smell. So just imagine chopped herbs, like um, think about things like uh, dried oregano, like you would put on pizza or something like that. There's definitely this um, opulent dry herb smell to go along with the um, aldehydic, very uh, smooth lavender, very masculine, very traditional in smell. This is a, um, you know, this is one of those fragrances that just feels so vibrant. And uh, the aldehydes and the um, lavender and the juniper and the citruses just give it that, like I said, that Italian, that freshness to it that, you, that you've that you come to expect from Italian perfumery, honestly, right? And that's where that slight fougere aspect comes in. But all of that changes very quickly. And like I said, the one thing you have to remember with this fragrance um, is that underneath it has that growl, right? So don't think of this as a greyhound, right? Think of this as a lion because there is a little bit of a growl underneath here and it starts from the beginning. You can hear it. It, it is not caged up. It's not pent up. It is right there underneath the surface waiting to be released. You can smell it and released it does get, I will tell you that. And so what ends up happening already, I probably sprayed this about 30 minutes ago, 25, 30 minutes ago, and already I'm getting more and more of those heavier, darker notes, the leather, the um, patchouli, the frankincense, the mossiness, the oak moss, the oak moss in this fragrance is absolutely beautiful, um, and that fresh, vibrant feel blends with the floral heart, which we'll definitely talk about. There's a beautiful floral heart. Oh, there's one other green note I should mention that I feel like blends into the top as well. It works kind of like a bridge, um, where it kind of um, bridges the heart and the top of the fragrance, and that's laurel, or also known as um, bay leaf, right? And so uh, if you think about grandma's um, cupboard again, um, you know, bay leaf adds to that herbal, dry, sort of, um, just imagine the imagery I want you to think about when you're smelling, when you're thinking about these herbs, is imagine like a bay leaf, but that isn't kept properly in its jar, right? Because they're supposed to be kept in the jar and the lid's supposed to be closed. But if you leave them out, they get dry and brittle, right? Imagine a brittle bay leaf where you touch it, it's so dry it almost like crumbles. It almost like crumbles into chopped oregano looking, looking um, green bits, right? And that's kind of the... Um, that's kind of the feeling of, of, of bay leaf in this fragrance. It's very subtle, but it definitely adds to that Mediterranean feel. That's a good way to put it. It adds to this like Mediterranean feel, if you will. Now, underneath the fragrance is where the lion starts to, to be released because many people actually refer to this fragrance by a name that it's not known as. The name is actually... Trussardi Uomo, which basically means Trussardi Man in Italian. Um, but some people refer to this as Trussardi Black. And the reason they refer to it as Trussardi Black is because of the black bottle, right? Uh, and so if you just think about that 80s style dark black leather underneath, and that's what begins to get 
unleashed as the fragrance continues into its dry down. So it's built like many 80s fragrances that you can think of. If you're a fan of 80s masculine perfumery, you will be right at home with Trussardi Uomo, I promise you. It is dark, complex. Um, you know, it's one of those fragrances that I really think that you can't... Um, it's not a fragrance that would sell well in today's market because this is not a fragrance that you could go to Sephora, sp spray it on, and make a decision like that, right? This is not that kind of a fragrance. This is a fragrance that you have to sort of live with it. You have to spend days, weeks with it. You know, it has to become part of your daily routine. It has to become part of, of you, basically. Um, and, I, and I really think that this fragrance will not do well on a, in a society that wants instant gratification because this fragrance changes throughout the wear. Um, and it, it, it really, um, it's complex is the best way to put it. It's really a perfume. I think it's a perfume for perfume lovers. I think that many people nowadays who are sick and tired of what modern perfume industry is putting out, who are, who are um, tired of the bland, you know, um, just, just no personality releases one after the other, right? They discontinue one, they put out another one. I think that this is really the type of perfume. I think this is the type of perfume that makes people fall in love with vintage fragrances. Let's put it that way. That's the best way for me to put it. I feel like this fragrance, um, won't do well with the spray it on and decide in one minute whether it's yours or not. Um, you really have to live with it and let it be part of your day and make it a partner in your journey of life is the way I describe it. But that sort of um, spicy herb dry down is be beginning to get accentuated with that animalic leather, which is coming up, you know, it's like the greyhound running, running the track, right? The animalic leather is running up from behind this fresher Italian opening. And already it's changing and it's coming in. It's such a beautiful leather. I love the leather in this because it's mixed with two of my favorite notes with leather, honey and iris. Those two notes are like secret ingredients when it comes to leather for me. Um, and the honey here, um, I have to say, the honey here is very um, sparsely used. It's elegantly used. Don't think about big bombastic honey fragrances. Don't think about the honey in Givenchy Gentleman from 1974. Don't think about that type of honey. Uh, don't think about the honey in Hugo Boss number no. one, which came out a couple years after this. And I have a vintage Hall of Fame review on Hugo Boss number no. one, if you would like to check that out as well. The honey here is, um, just used as a little bit of a sweetener, you know? Imagine putting just a little bit of honey into tea and letting it dissolve in, in, into the tea to the point where the honey is almost um, indistinguishable, but it just adds a little bit of sweetness. Don't think about the tea. Think about the blending in with the rest of the, um, of the tea example, right? So the honey just sort of blends in with everything else to just add the tiniest bit. I mean the tiniest bit of that um, eight that sweetness, right? Just a little bit. I think you may even have a hard time picking it out the first couple times you wear it, but as you continue to wear this fragrance, there will be points in time where it'll be hour four or hour five or hour six, and you'll say, there, there's the honey. There's the honey with the leather. It could be hour one for you. You know, every time I wear this, I feel like the curve of how the fragrance um, transitions on me changes. It's a very complex wear. It's a perfume lover's dream is really the best way I can describe it. And that goes both for the Scannon version and the Selective Beauty version. I don't know what it is about the these two. I don't know if the um, factory stayed the same and the name just changed or what, but there are multiple bottles I have from both Scannon and Selective Beauty. Different fragrances, by the way, not just this one. And I, they're almost identical to me. I, I don't get any, hardly any difference between the two. So just a little t side tidbit there I thought I should mention. So the leather in this is enhanced, okay? And it's enhanced with incense. And the incense in here is executed in that 80s style where, you know, it's it seems like it's more of a modern trend to have notes where you can pick each and individual note out, Right. In the old days, they didn't create fragrances in a way where they wanted you to be able to go, oh, there's the bay leaf, oh, there's the uh, marjoram, oh, there's the honey, there's the labdanum, there's the oak moss, there's the tonka bean, there's the frankincense. It didn't work that way. In the old days, they just kind of blended everything together. 
and it hit you in a blend and you get sort of the transitions, you get the ups and downs, like going up and down a hill, right? You can feel the fragrance transition as it goes from that more fougere top, more to that leathery chipra base, right? Um, but it's very hard to, to smell this fragrance and go, oh yeah, there's that frankincense. Cause it's not like a straight on church frankincense, but what it is, is it enhances the leather. It adds a little bit of smokiness. It adds a little bit of that wispy feeling to the leather when you smell it. Okay. That dark, um, you know, think of the Greyhound running at full speed, right? That leather is coming up on the rest of this fragrance and it comes up fast and it, when it hits, it all hits at once. And it's a beautiful accord that they created, but the um, bold elegance of the incense note in here is unmistakable. It's, but it's wrapped in that leather, okay? It's like the collar on the Greyhound, if that makes sense. Um, it hits at the same time, and it's lovely. It's spicy, it's leathery. The cedar wood and vetiver work in tandem to add a little bit of woodiness. Uh, along with the patchouli, the patchouli adds that 80s sort of uh, strength, if you will. And um, this is really sort of, um, you know, I think about two things that come to mind here. Bold, so the two ideas are like on one side, this bold, strong, powerful fragrance. On the other side, this elegant fragrance. And those two things are very hard to do nowadays, I think. And the reason I think it's hard to do is because as soon as you say bold, powerful, instantly people start going, well, what's the sillage? What's the longevity? Well, nowadays, if you want sillage and longevity, they just give you this reeking hunk of amber woods, right? That, that material that stays on your clothes for nine months after it touches your clothes because it's just, it's, it can be like a nightmare material for some people. Now, um, I don't hate all amber woods. I think there are amber wood fragrances that are used elegantly. I think there are different types of amber woods that are used that, you know, some people can accept and some can't. But um, in general, I agree that the fragrance industry has gotten extremely cheap and extremely lazy when it comes to implementing these ideas. And they just throw some amber woods in there. It's cheap. It lasts forever. And but it just kills the dry down when it's just an amber wood sometimes. Right. And this fragrance can do something that I think a lot of modern perfumery fails to do. And that's be both things at once. I think it's almost impossible for modern perfumery to be elegant and bold and assertive. And this fragrance does both. It is absolutely brilliant in how um, it gives you that bold, dark leather, okay? but also this elegance. There is this poshness, there's this class, there's style, you know. I think about, go go look up Nikolai Trussardi, the man, right? I think he ran Trussardi for decades brilliantly. And um, just look at his style. You know, if you can find old pictures of him and stuff like that, um, and go look at some of Trussardi's, like some of the people in the advertisements of, of Trussardi, Uomo. One of the guys in a straight out tuxedo, right? Um, and the other one is uh, in, in a suit standing behind this woman. And um, there's just, I mean, that is the style of this. This is an elegant masculine fragrance to me. And it's just so brilliantly blended. And there's so many little bits and pieces that you pick out as time goes on. Like, for example, the floral heart in this fragrance is made up of a couple flowers. It's made up of carnation, which is an old school masculine flower that I wish they used more of in masculine perfumery. It's made up of iris, which I've already said, iris and leather are like a hidden weapon for me. Anytime I see iris and leather together, I, I have a good feeling I'm really going to like the fragrance. I love that combination. And rose, okay? Those three flowers make up the heart, okay? And it's very common to see a floral heart in masculine perfumery, especially in the 80s. You know, you think about some of the all-time greats of the 80s. Fahrenheit had a huge floral heart, right? And um, so so did Trussardi um, Womo. Now, mind you, this is back in the day where it's not easy to, to pick up notes. But what ends up happening, what I think I end up getting is I think sometimes that carnation and rose, especially the spicy carnation, sort of blends upwards into the fragrance. And so just think about like a um, painter blending a painting, right, where two opposing colors meet and... They don't want just a hard line. They want the colors to be sort of blended. And I feel like the spicy carnation works brilliantly and just melts 
into that minty aromatic freshness of the top, that bitter freshness of the top. The spices, God, it's so beautiful. It's so unbelievably beautiful. And um, sometimes that sort of green incense-y bit that you get, that mossy greenness incense, blends with the leather and it just blends the bottom of the fragrance. And so that transition from aromatic sheep, aromatic fougere, if you will. I don't even think it's an aromatic fougere, but I don't have another way to describe it. That Italian fougere. Let's say that. Let's say Italian fougere instead of aromatic fougere. Because aromatic fougere draws a very specific idea for me. Um, and I don't think this is an aromatic fougere. You know, I wouldn't put this with other aromatic fougeres, right? Um, sometimes I absolutely love a good aromatic fougere. Sometimes at, at night you want to spray on a perfume before bed. Only a proper aromatic fougere will do. This is not an aromatic fougere. But let's just say Italian fougere at the top blends with that leather sheeper. I think it's closer to a leather sheeper than it is an aromatic fougere. Um, my guess is if you like things like Antaeus or Fendi Uomo or like I mentioned Moschino Porom or Bellamy or stuff like that, you'll love this fragrance. Um, you know, Dunhill Blend 30, you know, if you like those type of fragrances, I really think Trussardi Uomo is a must try. There's another one that I actually bought a bottle of and I returned it because I did not get the vintage and I wanted the vintage. It's Van Gill's Pour Homme. It's on my it's on my wish list. It's on my never ending wish list of uh, of fragrances. But um, these type of fragrances, you know, for for someone like me, this is the top. I mean, this is the mountaintop experience. There are uh, very few reviews of something like this on YouTube. And the reason there's very few reviews of it is because everyone nowadays is focused on trying to get the review out of the newest thing. They want to be the first to review Jubilation 40 or whatever thing that they're trying to review first so they can get as many clicks as possible. And I um, want to run my channel differently. I just honestly, I, I don't want to say I don't give a shit, but I don't. I don't care. I don't care whether this, view get, this video gets 500 views or 1,000 or... 200 or 10,000. I could care less, honestly. I want to bring content that very few people are talking about. And you know what? There's really only like one person that I saw, maybe two, do a video on this. And that's Chris from Scentland. He did a video on this from God knows how long ago, a decade ago. But he was pretending he was the godfather the whole time in the, in the video, which was kind of cool. But I wish they would have gone into a little bit more detail. So that's sort of what I wanted to add. Um, and, and I wanted to try to add a little bit more detail to, to, to his review. But I have to say, I mean, he was one of the ones that originally inspired me to look into vintage fragrances. So I have to kind of take my hat off to him um, for even doing the videos that no one else was touching. Uh, and discovering for me what I think is one of the greatest Italian fragrances ever made. And you may think I'm exaggerating. I'm not. I absolutely love this stuff. Uh, and, and what makes it such a killer is after everything I've told you, okay, after everything I've told you about how the fragrance progresses, the iris, which just adds that elegance. I really think it's the iris that makes the elegance in this fragrance, or one of the main elegant notes, mixes with that labdanum, leather, oak moss, patchouli, frankincense. Like, these are main masculine notes from the 80s, and it just gives it its own soul. I mean, this fragrance has a soul. Just like you, you look into the eyes of, of a dog, right? Um, and sometimes you have like a, sometimes you have a dog that, you know, they're like your family, right? If you've ever had a dog, I had two Scottish Terriers and they were with me for over a decade. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're long past. Um, Teddy and Winston or Teddy and Winnie or Theodore and Winston, if, or if you want to be proper, right? But, um, you know, I would look into their eyes and it's like someone's looking back at you. You know, it's like um, it's 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 really eerie how cognizant and alert and attached to you and, and in tune with your emotions. They are right. You know, they can feel something's right or wrong. You you kind of coming in or um, and and, you know, where. Um, um, you know, this fragrance has that it has that soul. It has that. Um, you know, it, it, it feels so alive when I wear it. I love that about this fragrance. It's um, it's an honor and a joy to wear it. I'm just, honestly, I'm sad that this is discontinued. I'm sad that this type of perfumery, not just this one, but all of my favorites are discontinued. 
Um, and I'm sad with what they're being replaced with, to be honest with you. You know, it's, um, it's funny because when you really get into fragrances, like, I think there are very few people who are probably into fragrances the way that, you know, I'm into fragrances. But um, the handful of people that are into fragrances that way on earth know that you could discover a new fragrance or two every day until the end of your life and you won't even scratch the surface. There are so many fragrances. And it's just kind of one of those things where you have to wear what you love. You have to. And everyone's loves are different, right? Um, you and I may both love vintage fragrances. I may love this. You may hate it. But my guess is, is that if you've only smelled modern designers, right? If you've only smelled Eros and Blue de Chanel and Sauvage and stuff like that, smelling these vintage fragrances will be like a slap in the face. It'll be like a wake up call. This is what men used to smell like. You know how when men used to take aftershave, they would slap themselves? Um, this is kind of like that for a, for a person entering perfumery, in my opinion. Um, and you talk about, you know, people get on there and they talk about siage and projection and all that stuff. And with these vintage fragrances, you never had to worry about that. This stuff lasts all day. It lasts all day. Um, I just reapplied at 8 o'clock. I, I sprayed it on this morning at 8.30. It's, it's, it was probably like uh, 8.45 when I reapplied this right before the video. Lasted all day on me. And, um, you know, you'll definitely make an appearance. If you want to stand out from the crowd... These are the type of fragrances I think that you should wear. The last thing I want to mention about this fragrance is that uh, there is a little hint. Sometimes I get it. Sometimes, honestly, I don't. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but sometimes it's there. There's a little hint of soapiness in this release. Just a touch. And what's interesting is soapy leather fragrances were very popular the decade, um, let's say, in this time period, soapy leather fragrances really started to kind of begin to take off. And one of them that came out a couple years before Trussardi Uomo is Oscar de la Renta Pour Louis. This is a beautiful soapy, leathery type aromatic fragrance, right? Um, and so it's interesting. Just There's just a little bit of that soapy freshness. Maybe it's the aldehydes. Maybe it's just the way everything is blended. Maybe, I don't know what it is, honestly. I couldn't tell you what gives off that soapy feel, but there's something in here. Maybe it's the musks, I don't know. But sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I get a little bit of a soapiness. And it's interesting because if you go back, this was 1981, Oscar de la Renta Pour Louis, okay? 1981, when Coros and Antaeus and all those fragrances were released. And in 1981, um, a soapy aspect, a cleaner aspect was already kind of being signaled. Uh, like the fresher times of the, the this, this was before things like Dracar Noir and Cool Water and all that stuff, right? Um, so this was like signaling those fresher times, even in 81. So in 83, if you believe Parfumo, 83, 84, whatever year you want to ascribe to this, um, they're, they they put just a little bit, just a little hint of that soapy leather in here. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think it adds, I think maybe it's a mixture of the aldehydes and the lavender, is my guess, where that little bit of soapiness is coming from. But honestly, outside of that, I have no clue. No clue where it's coming from. Maybe the juniper adds, I don't know. But all I know is it's beautiful. It is my kind of fragrance. It's the kind of fragrance I want to be... Um, associated with let's put it that way while everyone else is wearing their bullshit niche fragrances that are filled with bullshit amber woods or you know they're just walking around reeking um reeking of amber woods and i mean sometimes i'll get a whiff of someone at at work that has an amber wood heavy fragrance and it it literally um i, don't, I mean it almost makes me roll my eyes sometimes i'm like fuck uh, and meanwhile, they're like, oh shit, I smell cool. I want to smell like this. Like, fuck you. I want to smell like Trusardi Womo. So that's where I'm at. And, um, that's why I want to do these videos for you guys. So I hope you love these Vintage Hall of Fame videos. They're very hard for me to do because, um, I feel like I'm like reviewing a friend. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like I am, uh, reviewing a friend who's judging me for my review because no one's... It's almost like you're 
It's almost like you're giving a eulogy of a dead person to an empty room sometimes is what it feels like. And there's no one willing to speak up for the dead person but me. Uh, well, that's not fair. There are obviously other people who love this, but very few people are willing to take the leap and, and talk about these fragrances. Um, and, and very few people are willing to, you know, stand up and talk and stand up and talk about them is how, is how I really feel. And I feel this immense pressure to, to, to do a proper review. And it's very hard, very challenging, but I love these type of fragrances is the thing. My guess is if you're a young guy and you spray this on, you're going to think it's too animalic and too, too challenging. Stick with it. Put it aside, come put it aside for a couple months and come back to it. If it's still too challenging, put it aside for another couple months and come back to it. Spray it on at night before bed. Allow yourself to get accustomed to it. I promise, I promise by the by the fifth to tenth wear, you'll be in love with it. It'll be one of your favorite fragrances of all time if you love these type of perfumes. And even if you don't, I think it would be great to... I always wanted to step outside of the box. I always wanted to go against the stream. If everyone's wearing blue fragrances, that's the last thing I want to wear, in my opinion. Um, but but that's just me. You have to kind of make up your own mind. But um, this is definitely one to put on the wit on the wish list. So one of the best Italian fragrances of all time, the late great genius Nicolai Trussardi and the late great genius Beatrice Piquet teaming up to create one of my favorite Italian fragrances of all time. If you have experience with Trussardi Uomo, please let me know what your thoughts are. Um, leave it in the comments. I'd love to hear your experience with this fragrance or with the House of Trussardi in general. So cheers, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.